welcome atheists, agnostics, skeptics, free thinkers, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At CL Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural talked about from the podium. So the way it works here is anyone who is a member is invited to give a talk of their own choosing. And so today we have a talk um, on utilitarianism by Jack and I have been super excited and looking forward to it. So um, I'll let you get to it. All right, thanks Ruth. It's finally happening. <laughs> I'm finally giving this talk on utilitarianism that I promised months ago uh, to give. Um, during the first post sermon discussions, I opened my big mouth and talked about the utilitarian perspective on this and that or such and such, <clears throat> and it got people interested. So, uh, here we go. <laughs> first, uh, what is utilitarianism? That's a word I'm going to end up saying a lot. I'm going to end up slurring at some point. Yeah, utilitarianism. <clears throat> it's got too many syllables. In very rough terms, uh, utilitarianism is the ethical theory um, that we ought to bring about the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The first major work uh, on the topic is found in Jerry, Jeremy Bentham's Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, published in 1789. And another major contribution was John <coughs> Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism, uh, published in 1863. While utilitarianism comes in many forms and variations, it's motivated at bottom by little more than a sentiment of generalized benevolence. Do the most good. What does it mean to do good? <clears throat> Indeed, this is the central concern for all of ethics. Uh, what does it mean to do good? How can I lead an ethical life? How can I be a good person? There are many answers to these questions out there in the world, and lots of those answers come with strings attached. You know, just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and he'll show you the way. Or donate just another hundred dollars to unlock your next level of secrets. I'm not making any great spiritual promises here, and I'm not asking for anything but a little bit of your time. Uh, and I'm certainly not, <clears throat> uh, this happens to be just a topic of interest for me. Um, I studied it about 10 years ago in college, so I'm a little bit rusty. Um, and I'm certainly not presenting any kind of official position of the Seattle Atheist Church. <clears throat> um, I'm getting a lot of what I'll be talking about today from the text I was assigned in ethics class, uh, Utilitarianism for and Against by J.J.C. Smart and Bernard Williams. Um, we also had this accompanying text, uh, Morality, by Bernard Williams. Uh, Bernard Williams is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, re I noticed as I was uh, rereading this, uh, this book for the, today's talk that it was written in 1973. I'm sure there's been a lot of things written about uh, utilitarianism since then uh, that I haven't had the pleasure to read yet, so uh, I welcome any kind of correction or refinement of the ideas, ideas I'll be presenting today. Okay, let's get on with it. So my preferred formulation uh, for utilitarianism, out of the many variations that I've come across, um, is, it goes something like this. One ought to do the action that maximizes the expected happiness, understood as the pleasure and absence of pain. In short, this, this is an expression of hedonistic act utilitarianism. Hedonistic act utilitarianism. With just those three words, I'm taking a stand on three different positions in the philosophy of ethics. The first and biggest is utilitarianism itself. Utilitarianism is a specific theory in the more general consequentialist family. What distinguishes consequentialist theories uh, from other theories in ethics is that they claim that the only that only the goodness or badness of the consequences of a thing, like an action or a rule or a character trait, are relevant for judging that thing to be good or bad. Consequences are all that matter. Nothing else matters. But consequences to who? Who should we take into account when thinking about the consequences of our actions? Well, the answer that's easy to say and hard to do is everybody. <laughs> One important thing to note, though, is that you yourself are part of everybody. 
under utilitarianism, you give your own interests a weight of 1 over n, where n is the number of beings that we have some measure of moral responsibility towards. It seems reasonable that n includes uh, friends at the very least, and perhaps family as well. Uh, some com compelling arguments exist <clears throat> that n should include all humans. See, for example, Peter Singer's uh, Famine, Affluence, and Morality. Other compelling arguments have been made that it should include all sentient beings, like perhaps dolphins, elephants, and any other animal that shows some signs of having uh, some threshold level of intellectual capacity. And other good arguments have been made that it should include absolutely all conscious beings, or at least <clears throat> all beings capable of feeling pain or pleasure, including all animals. But in any case, utilitarianism gives your own interest a weight of 1 over n for some value of n. This is in contrast to simple ethical egoism, which reduces the denominator to one, as yourself is the only morally relevant concern. It's also in contrast to simple altruism, which reduces the numerator to zero and gives your own interests no weight in comparison to the needs and suffering of others. Under utilitarianism, your interests don't count any more than anybody else's, but they don't count any less either. Sometimes there's some confusion about the ultimate motive behind considering or, or adopting an ethical system. For example, one argument that some find compelling in favor, of, in favor of egoism is that if everyone just looked out for themselves and did so more effectively, everybody would be better off. It appears as though the motivation here is a consequentialist one. Everybody should be, everyone would be better off. But if that's our aim, shouldn't we try to aim at it more directly uh, instead of implementing this other system and hoping that it works out? Similarly, some claim that one should be an altruist because helping others makes you happy. It would appear that the driving motivation here then is our own happiness uh, and not that of others. In fact, the happiness of others is used rather more like a tool to get happiness in ourselves. That sounds more like egoism on that formulation. Perhaps these are just minor confusions that stem from taking sales pitches too seriously. In any case, I'll be making an effort to avoid muddying the waters with such, such statements. Okay, so back to consequentialism. You may be wondering, what do goodness and badness mean? Discussions about consequentialism tend to leave those terms vague on purpose. So they can focus on discussing whether there might be something besides just the consequences that's interesting for morality's sake, and leave some other theory to fill in the blanks about the particulars. Utilitarianism is one of those theories, slightly more specific than generalized consequentialism, and uh, in that it specifies goodness to be happiness. Happiness <coughs> is what utilitarianism is after, as much happiness as for as many people as possible. This is one part of its attractiveness. Utilitarianism expresses so simply what pretty much every ethical theory <coughs> tries to get at, maximizing happiness and makes, it, makes that its core and only tenet. After all, isn't happiness for everyone what everyone wants? Even religious systems of ethics seem to have this at heart, at least according to some of their salesmen. Feeling down, worried about some of life's challenges, having a rough go of things. Just trust in Jesus and you'll be happy. Jesus isn't just the best way to be happy, but he's also the only way to really be truly happy not just now in this life, but for all eternity. Of course, there's quite a bit more to it than that, but that's one angle for the sales pitch. Religious systems of ethics typically fall under the category of what's called deontological theories. That's another fun word to say many times. <laughs> deontological theories and the philosophy of ethics. Though there are also non-religious deontological systems. Deontological basically means duty-based and usually duty bound to follow a set of rules in, this, in uh, this context. Deontological systems of ethics face some difficulties that utilitarianism avoids. First, where do the rules come from? In religious systems, they often come from a god of some kind. Well, they, they come from people who claim to be speaking for a god. But then, of course, we can undermine the system of ethics by questioning the existence of the god and supposing, uh, that supposedly gave the rules. I mean, really? God said, don't eat pork? Are you sure it's not just 
that you don't know how to cook it without making everybody sick. <laughs> uh, really, God said that wives should always be, uh, should always obey their husbands in all matters. Are you sure you're not just making that up? <laughs> really, God said to invade that country over there and kill all the men, women, children, and even livestock. The concerns of this God sure seem to coincide with the concerns of the men in charge of the tribe. Act utilitarianism doesn't suffer from this problem. There's only one rule. Do the action that maximizes the expected happiness. Everything else flows from that rule. It's simple, but also flexible. Is eating pork making people sick? Don't eat it. Why? Because it's making people sick. And being sick isn't a happy thing to eat. Uh, not because some god said so. If someone figures out how to cook it so that it doesn't make people sick anymore, great. <laughs> Bake it. <laughs> <laughs> now go ahead and eat it. There's, there's no need to carry along any baggage about how, but God said not to eat it. It doesn't matter how you cook it. God said no. Then have to argue about what God meant at the time or whether God just didn't foresee the advent of new cooking technology or <clears throat> if God was just trying to dumb it down for primitive villagers to understand but now we know better, or anything like that, the only thing to appeal to is the consequences of actions. The second problem for any rule-based system is how to resolve conflicts. In any set of rules that covers enough of life's problems to be useful, some of those rules will come into conflict. Consider these simple rules. Always tell the truth, and always protect the less fortunate. These seem like totally reasonable rules, likely just a few among many others, probably not going to get you into trouble. And for the most part, they won't. But imagine you find yourself in Amsterdam in 1943, and you've got some Jewish people hiding in your attic to escape the horrors of the Holocaust. When the police come knocking, asking if you've seen any Jewish people around, which rule do you follow? If you tell the truth, the folks hiding out in your attic will surely be sent to a concentration camp. And most likely you along with them, or harboring them. If you have to keep protecting them, you're doing some amount of harm to the abstract institution of the social order, uh, and generally weakening the trust that we have in each other as people, trust that helps society function. Now, I hope that last bit didn't come across as compelling. It seemed clear to me that lying in this case is overwhelmingly the right thing to do, <clears throat> because human lives are generally more valuable than abstract institutions. But notice how resolving that conflict was nearly trivial by considering the consequences of the actions, and require a lot more argument, consideration, and appeal to various doctrines that must themselves be argued for in order to sort it out and cure deontology. A third problem for deontological ethics is the problem of how strictly to adhere to the rules, even when there is no conflict. Smart points out that <clears throat> though conceivably in most cases the dictates of a deontological ethics might coincide with those of human welfare and of an act utilitarian ethics, there must be some possible cases in which the dictates of the system clash with those of human welfare. Indeed, which the deontological principles prescribe actions which lead to avoidable human misery. There is, on the face of it, a necessity for the deontologist to defend himself against the charge of heartlessness, in his apparently preferring abstract conformity to a rule to the prevention of avoidable human suffering. In science, when trying to determine which of the two competing hypotheses to accept, you look for places where their predictions differ, and test those places. If all goes well, the predictions of one hypothesis would be wrong, and the predictions of the other would be right. Perhaps you find a few more places like that, <clears throat> and try a few more tests, and hopefully the same results turn up. In the same way, we can consider which ethical theory will be more conducive to overall human happiness. On the one hand, a sufficiently sophisticated deontology that painstakingly avoids as many conflicts as possible and has the most reasonable ordering of which rules to apply when. And on the other hand, act utilitarianism. It would appear that most of the time, both systems would advise the same course of action. And so we don't need to choose between them. But whenever they diverge, it will be because following the rules of the deontological system would bring about more suffering, or fail to bring about as much happiness as the act utilitarian, uh, as act utilitarianism would in the same circumstances. So it would appear, at this point at least, 
that fact utilitarianism would, in every case, be equivalent or superior to deontology. Hint, there's still some reason to be skeptical. Unfortunately, I won't have time to cover them in this talk, but uh, they're out there. Perhaps in a future talk. Okay, so, so far, <clears throat> I've introduced act utilitarianism along with a very brief and very rough treatment of deontology and a passing mention of ethical egoism and altruism. I'd like to introduce another variation of utilitarianism called rule utilitarianism. Under act utilitarianism, the main objects of moral consideration are actions. <clears throat> um, one of Smart's formulations is that act utilitarianism is the view that the rightness and wrongness of an action is to be judged by the consequences, good or bad, of the action itself. In contrast, under rule utilitarianism, the main objects of moral consideration are rules. Smart, uh, Smart's formulation is that rule utilitarianism is the view that the rightness or wrongness of an action is to be judged by the goodness or badness <clears throat> uh, of the consequences of a rule that everyone should do the same in like circumstances. Rule, util rule utilitarianism seems to avoid the first problem we discussed with deontological systems of ethics. That is, it answers where do rules come from. Rules are made with regards to the goodness and badness of the consequences of the rule. Uh, perhaps as long as the goodness outweighs the badness by some threshold. It's uh, tempting to think that the, th the threshold ought to be where the goodness and badness are equal, but uh, given the, the uncertainties that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, perhaps we ought to have some reasonable buffers so we have room for our calculations to uh, be wrong and uh, still end up with the right answer. But anyway, let's not dwell too long on that. Smart prefers act utilitarianism to rule utilitarianism, and I do as well because I find his arguments compelling. Here's what he says. Briefly, <coughs> uh, it boils down to the accusation of rule worship. The rule utilitarian presumably advocates his principle because he is ultimately concerned with human happiness. Why then should he advocate abiding by a rule when he knows that it will not be, in the present case, be the most beneficial to abide by it. To refuse to break a generally beneficial rule in those cases in which it seems, in those cases in which it is not most beneficial to, to obey, it seems irrational and to be a case of rule worship. That is to say, rule utilitarianism suffers from the third problem that deontological systems face. How strictly does one adhere to the rules? Smart also presents some arguments from David Lyons. Suppose that an exception to rule R produces the best consequences. Then this is evidence, evidence that the rule R should be modified so as to allow the exception. Thus we get a new rule of the form do R, except in circumstances of the sort C. That is, uh, whatever would lead the act utilitarian to break a rule would lead the rule utilitarian to modify the rule. Thus an adequate rule utilitarianism would be extensionally equivalent to act utilitarianism. So after coming across enough exceptional circumstances where it's clear that following the rule would result in avoidable human suffering, more and more rules be modified to allow for these exceptions, and the system of rules becomes ever more complex and unwieldy. And finally, when all that's said and done, we're left with a system that recommends basically the same course of action as act utilitarianism. That is, rule utilitarianism appears to collapse into act utilitarianism. Smart again. I'm inclined to think that an adequate rule utilitarianism would not only be extensionally equivalent to the act utilitarian principle, but would in fact consist of one rule only, the act utilitarian one. Maximize probable benefit. Uh, other objects of moral consideration that have been brought up in the literature include such things as a person's character. For example, that one ought to cultivate in oneself and others a character that will best promote overall happiness. I'm optimistic that <clears throat> all other such forms of uh, utilitarianism will collapse into act utilitarianism along similar lines of argument as a uh, rule utilitarianism case. But I welcome further discussion on that point. But worry not, O oh, lovers of rules. There is a place for rules in act utilitarianism. Whew. 
Everything we do is an action. All actions take time. That's true whether we're watching TV, running for the bus, doing our homework, eating dinner, whatever we're doing. It's even true if we're thinking about what consequences are likely to follow from certain actions we might be doing. Thinking about consequences takes time. Time spent doing one thing means we can't spend that time doing something else. It has an opportunity cost. Most of the decisions we come across in day-to-day -day life aren't big enough, important enough, or consequential enough to spend the time considering all the myriad possible consequences and what probabilities to attach to those consequences. For example, should we have peas or carrots for, with dinner tonight? This might not be as trivial as uh, it first appears. Uh, where do the peas come from? Where do the carrots come from? Uh, is the farm where the peas are grown using the money they're making for good, neutral, or bad purposes? Are they donating to charity? Are they buying just what they need to live? Are they funding terrorism? Uh, are they using slave labor? How much pollution are they creating with their fertilizers and their pesticides? <clears throat> uh, what about their supply chain? How are the companies involved uh, there behaving? Oh, and how does all that compare to the farm that's growing carrots? Man, I'm exhausted just saying all that. Imagine trying to dig in and find all that information for all of the options you have available to you at the supermarket. Not to mention all the health concerns, right? And tastes and preferences. And some things cost more than others. Oh, and by the way, which supermarket do you go to? Okay, never mind. This is a, this is a very expensive query to run, considering the time and effort involved in finding all of these answers. And once you do find the answers, you'll likely have very little impact. You're unlikely to discover uh, something uniquely terrible about one farm versus another, uh, like that one is using slave labor. It's not unreasonable to trust the government to some extent to keep tabs on that sort of thing and crack down when necessary. Though it is possible, <clears throat> there have been over uh, 1,200 people freed from agricultural slavery in Florida in the past 10 to 15 years. I was very surprised to find that out. Um, <clears throat> As a rule of thumb, it's best to spend your limited time elsewhere doing something that will have a larger expected return on your time in terms of happiness created and or suffering prevented for you and others. Rules of thumb. Rules of thumb are often computational shortcuts like we just talked about. Good guidelines that lead you to the right or at least good enough answer quickly without having to do, uh, go through all the work with proper calculations every single time that you act. Sometimes it's just a nice way to save time, like the peas and carrots example, where the opportunity cost might be something for leisure time, but you might do it sometime if you're bored. Sometimes you don't have any time to think. Imagine you're standing on the sidewalk and you notice a toddler stroll out into uh, the road while the parent is distracted by something else. Imagine there's some oncoming traffic that's also distracted by something else and doesn't see the toddler, but it's far enough away that you have time to swoop in and save the kid. You, by some coincidence, are not captivated by some distraction. Uh, now is not the time to break out a spreadsheet <clears throat> and start thinking about all the possible outcomes of all the actions that you have available to you. It doesn't matter that you could take this moment to write a big fat check to one of the top rated and most effective charities on GiveWell. It doesn't matter that the child might grow up to be Hitler. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter that the loss of the child uh, might have some profoundly good effect on the currently distracted parent after a long period of deep suffering. You just jump into traffic and save the child. Just save the child, okay? This is a good rule of thumb to internalize. <laughs> there are many other good ones too. For example, uh, keep your promises. Why? Not because it's just a rule from the ether that promises must be kept, uh, but because in the vast majority of circumstances, the benefits of keeping one's promises outweighs the detriments of failing to keep it for the promiser, for the promisee, and for society at large, which plausibly functions better with a stronger rather than weaker institution of promise keeping. In a society where promises are generally kept, you can, uh, you can more often trust that people are going to deliver on what they owe you, though sometimes they won't. And businesses can run much more smoothly. But sometimes it's better to break a promise. But better in what sense? 
more convenient for me personally? No, utilitarian has a higher bar than that. Uh, better in terms of promoting overall happiness. It's easy to make a situation where breaking promise is morally required. Indeed, required, not just permitted. Just consider the Aunt Frank scenario uh, from before, but imagine you have promised to tell the truth uh, and always cooperate with the occupying Nazi forces. Does that change things? Or perhaps you had promised to wait your, for your friend on the sidewalk when you noticed the toddler strolling in traffic. Uh, for another example, don't kill people. Killing people is bad, okay? <laughs> but why? Because it just is? Perhaps because we rather don't like the idea of being killed ourselves, and so we'd like to see that uh, that general rule exists? No. Because the cost of killing someone in terms of reducing happiness and causing pain and suffering is massive. Take just a moment to think it out. You have to add up the suffering caused to all the victim's closest family and friends. Husband, wife, children, brother, sister, mother, father. You have to take into account any financial damage done to their survivors <coughs> from whatever medical bills are incurred. You have to add up the lesser suffering caused on all the people who know those people and who feel for their loss. You have to take into account the unrealized potential net happiness that person would likely have had if they'd continued living. As well as the happiness gained by their productivity in the world and the people they interacted with on a daily basis but didn't really know, like the barista at the coffee shop they frequent. Some of these are orders of magnitude more important than others but should be weighted appropriately. But everything should be taken into account. When all said and done, this is an absolutely massive amount of suffering and harm introduced to the world. This is vastly more than enough to outweigh any benefit to someone per se, being unsafe while commuting to work and running someone over accidentally. This is vastly more than enough to outweigh the benefit of driving while drunk, as inconvenient as it is to take a bus or call a cab. Don't drink and drive, it's another good rule of thumb. This is vastly more than enough to outweigh the benefit, even to a psychopath, of killing another human for pleasure. Killing someone is really, really bad. And we don't need to work through these calculations every time we have the option to kill someone. We can and should internalize this rule of thumb. But, while the amount of suffering brought upon the world by killing someone is massive, that massive barrier is not insurmountable. There are some cases where killing someone is not just permitted, but is morally required. In most such cases, there's a very particular someone in mind, and they're doing a very particular thing that's going to cause a lot more pain and suffering in the world. It's easy to imagine such a situation. Consider someone trying to assassinate the president. They're about to do it, and if they aren't stopped in the next 10 seconds, they will succeed. Assassinating the president would incur all of the costs of killing anyone else plus a lot of additional costs of the chaos of the nation and the world, what important deals or international agreements might fall through, uh, etc. On first glance, and without further details about the specific case, it appears morally required to kill the assassin. Of course, this does not apply to cases where you have more time to act, where you can foil the assassin uh, before stopping him becomes so urgent and bring them to justice in a court of law. So killing people has terrible consequences. And on account of those consequences, don't kill people is a good rule of thumb to internalize. It can be broken, but the situation has to be very dire indeed to outweigh the negative consequences. And most situations just aren't that dire. Okay, so notice what I'm not doing here. I'm not saying, but that doesn't matter because it's not about pleasure or pain, or that doesn't matter because it's inconvenient and doesn't lead to the conclusions that I want. Utilitarians, utilitarians can't dismiss inconvenient considerations that easily because at bottom they are about happiness and so they must be added to the scales uh, to be weighed against all the other considerations. This is what it means to make your best effort at a sincere, good faith, moral reckoning. So rules of thumb are the place uh, for rules in act utilitarianism. I believe they are the place for well, I hesitate to say all, but pretty much all of our ethical intuitions. Keep your promises, 
Don't kill people. Don't steal. Don't lie. Usually. I believe this is also the place in action utilitarianism for the ethical intuitions that we get from evolution. We've heard a lot about evolutionary ethics here at the Atheist Church. Uh, we've heard about the sense of fairness that monkeys have when you give them unequal rewards and the one who gets a lesser reward uh, gets angry and refuses even the reward that it was given. I think that the evolutionary nature of these intuitions means that most of us will very likely have certain predictable um, reactions to certain situations, uh, like that of unfairness. These emotions should be taken into account in the utilitarian, utilitarian calculation, and then it turns out that fairness is another good, good rule of thumb uh, to internalize. But I don't th think that these intuitions, merely because they, we receive them through evolution, uh, deserve any further special place in our considerations. We should obey them, go with our gut, so to speak, unless we have good evidence that suggests that doing so would bring about a disproportionate amount of pain and suffering. Okay, how are we doing on time? All right. <laughs> so I'd like to um, talk about the last philosophical stake in the ground that I've made, which is the hedonistic view of happiness, but it consists uh, that it consists in pleasure in the absence of pain. But I'm running out of time, so I think I, it'll be more fun to uh, talk through some more examples. Uh, exploring examples is where it's at in philosophy of ethics. <laughs> First, I'd like to introduce some terminology that will help us make sense of these examples. When discussing actions, it's useful to think about how they fit along three dimensions, uh, which Smart brings up in his book. Uh, right, right versus wrong, rational versus irrational, and praiseworthy versus blameworthy. These are orthogonal. The right action on utilitarianism is the action that does, in fact, in the actual world, end up creating the most possible happiness. All other actions offer wrong. But notice, it's nearly impossible to determine what the consequences of your actions will be. You have incomplete information uh, about pretty much everything that's morally relevant. And on top of that, a lot of reactions to your action and reactions to those actions and so on are probabilistic. So this might seem like a really strict bar, and it is. But that's no reason to reject it. Smart uses the terms rational and irrational to take that lack of knowledge into account. The rational action is the one that is the best guess you have at the time, uh, given your current knowledge, to create the most possible overall happiness. Think of it as, uh, like if you're playing chess against the computer and you say, okay, move now, of course move. Whatever they were thinking about, okay, now pick the best thing you've come up with so far and just do it. Uh, you can be mistaken about many things, and your rational action may not end up being the right one. Or maybe it will. You have to do the best you can with what you have. And you may have the time to look, at it, look into it more and find out more information uh, that will better inform your decision. But you may not. And that's the best anyone can ever do. Crucially, these are distinguished as orthogonal from the axis of praiseworthy versus blameworthy. As I said before, everything you do is an action. Praising and blaming other people's actions are themselves actions. And these actions have consequences. Praising an action tends to encourage it to continue, both in the person who's receiving the praise and in those who witness them receiving the praise. Blaming an action tends similarly to discourage it. Often these attributes are aligned. The right action is also rational and it's also praiseworthy. Uh, for some actor acted irrationally, ended up doing something wrong, and are blameworthy for doing so. But sometimes they're not so aligned. Let's explore some examples. Uh, first, we have the infamous or famous trolley problem. Who remembers the trolley problem from before? Yeah, someone else? Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's say you've got, uh, you're in a streetcar with a trolley, and uh, there's a fork in the tracks, and uh, there's some workmen working on the tracks. And for whatever reason, they're not being very safe right now. They're using their headphones, uh, and they cannot be communicated with. So uh, that you know they can't hear any kind of bell or horn or anything, and uh, this is one of those like mostly automated um, trolley cars. So the, the driver is like I don't know wandered off someplace, and uh, you see this coming up ahead because you're paying attention, and you notice that right now 
the track is set so that you will go and hit the uh, five people who are working on one branch, and on the other branch of the tracks uh, is only one person. You have it in your ability to switch a switch that will cause the tracks to shift, and so you can uh, go on the other set of tracks instead, spare the five people, but kill the one. Okay, who thinks we should switch the switch? All right, who thinks we shouldn't switch the switch? All right. Um, well, I think that given the amount of information that we have, uh, the <laughs> moral philosophy. <laughs> Uh, given the information that we have, I think that switching the switch is the right thing to do. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, rational thing to do. Um, because we don't have, all we know is there's five people versus one person, you know, they're probably average, we don't really know anything about them. Uh, I don't think it's really morally relevant whether I uh, switch it or leave it. Um, if I leave it going and just ha so happens to hit the five people, I think I'm still sort of morally responsible for not switching it. Um, now, it might, it might turn out, once you learn some more information about these people, that uh, the, the one person that, that you end up running over was uh, actually like a really upstanding member of the community, and they were doing a lot of uh, good work and things like that. And maybe someone in the, in the five group was this really terrible person, just like slack all the time, was basically just a drunk, and you know, only has a job uh, sort of provisionally. Um, so it might turn out that flipping the switch was wrong uh, in the end, but given what you knew at the time, I think it's uh, rational and praiseworthy, blameworthy. It's hard to guess. Probably shouldn't encourage people to go and mess with uh, Charlie's controls. You know, while the drivers wander away. Uh, usually a bad, bad plan. But uh, but maybe it's okay to like have a have a you know, positive article in the newspaper about this, this particular hero of ours. Um, okay, let's think about the. We have time for one more. Um, let's think about uh, the drowning man in the lake. So, let's say you <clears throat> come across a lake. It's a person drowning yet? There's nobody else around. Uh, you have pretty good reasons to believe that if you don't take some action. Uh, that person's going to drown. And uh, so, it seems rational. You just save, save the guy. We don't really need to think out all the consequences. Um, you know, just use the rule of thumb. Um, turns out you're in a lake in Germany, right? <laughs> Ever present example in like, uh, whatever, 1930 uh, something. And uh, turns out this guy was Hitler, and you probably should have let him drown. And you had no way to know that until you know way later, um, and it's not even discovered that uh, you even did that by like, townspeople or whatever for another say 50 years. And so it seems like your action was rational given what you knew at the time. You know, just save people drowning in lakes, right? That's a good that's a good thing to do. Uh, wrong, because obvious reasons it's Hitler, and yet probably still praiseworthy. The town would probably want to give you some sort of award of recognition to further encourage people to generally save people drowning in lakes. That's probably a good thing. Uh, most of them aren't going to be Hitler. Um, okay, well, I guess that's enough I'm talking for now, and uh, <coughs> let's join up in a circle and discuss.